Good morning, everybody, and well, welcome to the latest in our leadership webinar series. Today, we're looking at the role of leadership development in the 21st century, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome some fantastic speakers who are joining us today, uh, and also to welcome all of you. I believe we have 200 people who are registered on this webinar, and obviously we will be having many others who join us for the recording afterwards. So firstly, my name is Zoe Arden, and I'm an Associate Director here at CISL, and I'm delighted to welcome Elsbeth Donovan, who is Deputy Director of our South Africa office, who is joining us from Cape Town, Desiree Shuck, who is the Head of Leadership Development at Anglo-American, and Sasha Watson, who's a Leadership an engagement specialist, most recently who spent the last six years at ARM and at the end of this month is joining Moonpig as the head of people. So welcome to all our speakers, absolutely thrilled to have such a fantastic lineup. And um, so just a, a quick note in terms of what we're going to be covering today. So firstly, as usual, please feel free to comment and ask questions throughout the webinar using the chat function. We have ensured that there'll be lots of time at the end for your questions. So please keep the questions coming and we will be, in, be sure to answer as many of those as possible during the hour. Secondly, for those of us who are joining us uh, post the webinar, welcome. There will be a recording of this webinar alongside all of the other webinars in our Introducing Leadership webinar series and you can access those through the CISL website. Our next webinar, the final one for the year, is on collaborative leadership for change, and that's taking place on the 10th of December, and we look forward to having you join us then. And just a reminder that um, a couple of the resources that we mention during this hour include our rewiring leadership paper, and also some recent research that we did on the role of learning and development and HR in building leaders for long-term business success. So both those papers are actually available on the CISL website. So with no further ado, uh, firstly, um, just a, a comment on the leadership gap, which we'll be considering during this webinar. And um, in particular, the really important role of leadership development professionals in working to ensure that we have leaders that can thrive in the volatile, uncertain, complex, and um, difficult environment in which we're operating. So this is a really, really important question to address, and we're delighted to, to welcome onto this webinar in terms of um, listeners, both um, audiences from sustainability professions and also from L&D. And uh, when we addressed this in our leadership research, we found that there was certainly a need for um, better cooperation between these um, different roles. And some of the key takeaways that we found in the research was um, certainly um, a few key aspects. So firstly, with regard to innovation, we're seeing that um, L&D professionals are creating innovative programs working in partnership with sustainability folk. And that includes changes both to processes and frameworks as, as well as the programs that are created. Secondly, unfortunately, there is no silver bullet when it comes to leadership development. And uh, what we found was that a multi-pronged approach uh, works best. And we'll be hearing some examples from all our speakers um, in terms of what they've used when it comes to uh, leading practices. Finally, um, uh, thirdly, one of the um, key points that we found is that Leadership development works best with regard to building sustainability leaders when it comes to actionable learning. So how can we deliver learning that is um, actionable, teachable and um, learnable in chunks, so relevant to day-to-day -day job, applicable to current spheres of influence and, and where there's the opportunity to sort of iterate the learning. And the final point, which we'll also be covering and uh, Elspeth in particular will be speaking to, is how do we build in reflection? How do we build in the time to actually reflect on our learning and apply the learning so that we've got this continuous process, if you like, of relearning, unlearning, and uh, learning again? So final key point I wanted to, to make, and then I'm gonna introduce Sasha to, to reflect on this, is 
key takeaways that came out of this piece of research, both for L&D professionals, HR professionals, and sustainability professionals. Um, so as you would expect, it's, it's how do these three groups work together uh, to ensure that they're building um, on each other's expertise. So firstly, from an L&D perspective, how do we create programs that build awareness of the external context? Um, and on the sustainability side, that means how do we make sustainability relevant to HR and learning and development? And on the HR side, how do we ensure that we're um, making our processes forward looking as well as looking back in terms of past performance? So a few key other takeaways there, and, and we'll really bring those to life when we start to speak to our speakers. Right, so um, with no further ado, um, Sasha, I'd like to introduce you to comment on this actually, and, and, and we're, we're very lucky to have you joining us for this webinar, because I know that you've worn many of these hats. Uh, so in your in your career, which started in communications, so so you looked at the world from that perspective. You've very much looked at learning development and employee engagement from your roles with organisations like Barclays and Dell, and um, also built in sustainability and the experience piece, particularly in the last six years working at Arm. So would be really interested in your key takeaways when it comes to how do we build. Um, leaders for, for long-term business performance and how do we ensure that that our businesses can thrive in a on a livable planet so keep interest in your thoughts Sasha thank you Zoe and good morning everybody so I think one of my first um, tips is you, you don't expect your colleagues across all these other disciplines to completely understand what what you do but it's so powerful if you can integrate activities as much as possible. Like you said, Zoe, with there being no silver bullet, a multi-pronged approach from my perspective is all of these groups and individuals and knowledge centers coming together to co-create um, content. And even if you just agree on some key outcomes and build pieces of work together, I've seen and experienced some real shifts in, in business and in leaders um, just from working like that. And I was fortunate in my role at ARM to create with colleagues the ARM Leadership Conference. And what that meant is from a communications perspective, we looked at the strategy and the messaging and the development. From a learning perspective, we looked at the actual leadership development um, pieces. The sustainability team helped us think about the state of the business and the business context we're operating in. And then some of our HR team helped us look at learning interventions and what new frameworks activities we would introduce. So I've actually seen this work really powerfully in practice. You talked Zoe about actionable learning and I totally agree that unless you make the learning real and um, it loses its impact. So again, I recall being um, on some leadership development training myself, um, looking at difficult conversations. And the theory was amazing, but only when I had to sit with my colleagues and practice a difficult conversation, did the learning and the shift really kick in. Um, I think some top tips as, as well is around accountability. So rather than there just being a learn intervention, a meeting or a piece of work is how do you hold people accountable for, for the learning and the work? You know, how can HR teams in particular um, build into performance management or, you know, what other places can you can you intervene to really make sure that people are accountable? And the last piece is around focusing on the long term. And I've been doing a lot of work recently looking at organizational capability. And I think that is how you build on the longer term. It's not just about building skills, it's about building capability. And the look and look at the difference between those two. Yeah, that's wonderful, Sasha. Thank you so much. Um, really, really good summary. I think, as you said, leadership on sustainability requires a different set of interpersonal skills. Yeah. Skills such as anticipation, storytelling, listening and unlearning. And I'd now like to introduce Elsbeth Donathan, who is going to give us the sort of the foundational pieces, if you like, of, of leadership development. 
And, and Elsbeth, I'm, I'm going to introduce you, and I know that you're going to cover sort of four key aspects, which are going to be firstly, you know, what do we mean by the global leadership mindset that we're trying to build? Two, what, what particular tools do you use? And I know you're going to give us the example of, of one in particular. Three, where do we start when we're building um, leadership? particularly sustainability leadership, and you're going to talk us through the leadership practice framework that you use. Um, and, and, and finally, just a, a thought on, on technology and, and how we need to, to bring in that. So, so welcome, Elsbeth. I'm, I'm particularly thrilled to have you join us. Um, Elsbeth has, has been with CISL for, for some time and um, is very much our, our go-to leader when it comes to building a, a global leadership mindset. So. So Elspeth, over to you. you know, what, what are the key aspects of that, would you say? Uh, thanks, Zoe, and, and hello, everybody. Um, it's quite strange, I can't see you, but I know you're out there. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and, and I just want to say, everything I say is actually in the rewiring leadership. It's sort of, I'm just doing a very a summary of the things that I think are really important. And, and I particularly like what Christiana Figueres, who used to be the executive secretary of the IPPC, um, when she spoke about a global leadership mindset, she spoke about really very important that, you ha that there's a moral compass, there's values, and that you are, as a leader, willing to get support and ask for help and not just think you have to go it alone. I think other aspects she spoke about was uh, the importance of seeing connections and understanding who you need to speak to, and then the time that it takes to build trust and knowing that you have to meet people where they are and, and you need to take the time to build trust. She speaks about exercising what she calls stubborn wisdom, and anybody who works in the field of sustainability in particular, and I think leadership generally is you have to be patient and tenacious. And then she also talks about this inner wisdom, which is that ability to just stop, try and reflect, try and, and think about quietly about what you're feeling when you're hearing something in order to make decisions and not always let your ego and your knowledge get in the way, but to be able to actually sort of just unclutter your mind in order to be able to, to see and feel things differently when you're making decisions. So if we take that into what sustainability leadership skills look and what we try to develop through our programs, it's really important um, that, that when you design a program that you have, you have these practices embedded in it. And one of the things that's really important is understanding the importance of reflection and, and to understand yourself, to build your own self-awareness. There's also... Um, understanding the importance of how you behave, how you show up, that you're curious, you engage, you ask questions and you practice. This notion of willingness to be disturbed, to sit with discomfort, because often that's when change happens and that comes sort of out of the work of Margaret Wheatley where you really understand how important it is to, to sit with discomfort and understand why you're feeling uncomfortable. I always talk about going slow to go fast and how important it is for you to do the, the sort of upfront work before you do anything. So really to think deeply about what's going on, what you're noticing, how you're feeling before you start to take action. Your relationships to yourself, to others and to the context in which you operate are really important. So that, that awareness of what's going on around you, which is also obviously linked to being a systems thinker where actually we need to understand there's an interconnectedness of all things. Yeah. Now how do I then take this and apply it to how I design a program? And one of the key things is um, I think what we've lost is this ability to pay atten attention. We're so busy in our works and, and behind our, our um, devices that we're actually not necessarily no noticing what's going on around us. And so it's really important that um, we're able to really think deeply about what it is and what it is that what, what's happening and what we're seeing. So I use um, Otto Sharma's youth theory as a sort of underlying pedagogy of the way I design a program. And I start every program I run with quieten your cleverness so that you can hear new things, which is really talking about your internal wisdom. And so what Otto Sharma did when he did research into who are successful leaders and what is it that they do that makes them successful, it was 
he came up with this U theory where he said successful leaders really pay attention to what's going on around them. They're able to suspend their voice of judgment and to, by, doing, by opening their mind, they're able to see things with fresh eyes. And you'll notice you're going down the, the left-hand side of, of this, this, this picture in front of you. And then you take a deeper dive and go into the field, which means go out and actually walk around and notice, so called sensing from the field. And that also requires you to suspend that voice of cynicism that gets in the way of us seeing, connecting to things in an empathetic way and really understanding how other people do see things. And getting to that place where you let go, which requires you to suspend your voice of fear, which obviously gets in the way of change. And this requires you to open your will, this notion of where there's a will, there's a way. And that we talk about you get to the bottom of the you where you sort of sit in quite an uncomfortable place thinking about, well, gosh, what is my role in this? It's not those other people that have to do something. Me as me as a leader, I must do something. So what's my work? And you start to allow a whole lot of new ideas come to you. And you have this ability to sort of crystallize your vision and your intention, which is really important that people understand what your intention is. You then enact, you try things, you prototype. Obviously, things sometimes fail initially, but you keep trying and you reach your goals. So the idea is that instead of seeing something or hearing information and immediately reacting to it, which is called jumping across the you, you take a deeper dive and go deep into thinking about, so what does this actually mean for me and the work that I do? And where I've used this in, I'll just give one example, in, in a women's leadership program was a global uh, company that uh, wanted to retain their women leaders and they found they often left because they didn't understand the value of the work they were doing and the purpose of their work. And so we created these sort of experiential, what we call learning journeys, where they're able to go into communities and different places which they didn't even occur to them that they would be having an impact in such places with the kind of products they produce and the services they deliver. And so it created a whole new freshness in the way these women in this organization felt about their role in their work, in, in their company, as well as in society. So it was, yeah, it was just an example of how that can be quite a powerful experience. Yeah, that's, so, that's, a, that's a great example. Thank you, Elspeth. Um, and as you said, you know, certainly our research identified um, the importance of having a multi-pronged approach, but um, actually highlighted that experiential learning was really effective as well. So it's, it's, it's brilliant for you to actually talk us through that theory, you, and how you've actually how you actually use that in designing your programs. Great, thank you. Um, then I'll uh, talk about one of the things I also get uh, in programs that I run is to get people to develop what I call a leadership practice framework, which is a really important part of, of understanding yourself, because if you want to understand others, you need to understand yourself. So if you want to walk in other people's shoes, you need to understand the shoes that you're walking in yourself. So this is what, why it's a really important thing to do. So you, uh, you it's about thinking about your belief system and, and understanding why you think the way you do and also gives you an opportunity to inquire about how other people are feeling. It also helps you to understand where your discomfort lies and why you might find certain situations more difficult than others and also where there's possibilities for opportunities and helps you with your decision making. So I know what your triggers are. It also makes you become more thoughtful in the way that you do things instead of being complacent, particularly good at uh, building your capacity to work across disciplines, with interdisciplinary work, because this ability of understanding what is the value that you bring, but what are the things that you need from others. And then also, if you understand your own assumptions, it's much easier for you to do that if you want to get, engage and challenge other people's assumptions. So this is why you would develop a leadership practice framework. And then it's really important, key points about a framework is there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, it's it's it just no one size fits all. It all depends on you personally, what works for you. It's, it's an iterative type of thing. So are you constantly working on it and going back to it and checking if anything's changed? It's a reflection of where, where you're coming from, not where you are going. 
And I think it's a really useful tool because it's not about who you want to be, but it's who you are right now. And often this helps you un discover leadership development things that you think are required, particularly if you're moving into a new job. And there's no one particular way to develop a framework. It depends what works for you. And I'm just going to share a picture of a wonderful practice framework of a hand that was a community worker. Um, oh, sorry, that hasn't been included in the slides, but one of a community worker that was working in India was asked by, by Oxfam and uh, people that she was working with, how do you sort of hold yourself together? How is it that you're able to do this really difficult work in, in poor communities? And she said, I just look at my hand and each of my digits represents something that reminds me how important it is the work that I'm doing. And I can't, I won't go into the detail of each digit, but I just thought it was such a simple methodology is to have a hand and that each of your digits represented something that she said, I constantly look at my hand and know what I'm doing is really important even when it gets tough. The other thing that I thought was quite important for to think about in leadership development and in, in, currently and in the future is our move to a much more uh, in, uh, sort of fourth industrial revolution or this very connected world that we're in. What does that mean? for developing leaders. And particularly in a country like where I live, it's often thought that it's going to exacerbate inequality. So how do you help leaders understand how, you, how relationships are really important, how transparency becomes really important, how your ability to be empathetic, to adapt and to adjust and to really understand how people are being impacted by this in terms of, of the future. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Elspeth, and um, thank you for uh, taking us through those sort of really key building blocks, if you like, in terms of, of leadership development. So starting with how do we build a global leadership mindset, the role of tools like Theory U in creating programs, and then starting with something like a, a personal practice framework. And sorry, we didn't have the picture of the hand there for you all, but again, shows the benefit of storytelling, actually. I'm sure we could all picture a hand and what those individual digits might look like. So um, thank you, thank you so much for that, Elspeth. It was a, a really useful, useful foundational piece. And, and we'll hear from Desiree shortly in terms of how she builds, brings some of those essential building blocks to life in the program that she runs for Anglo. But before I introduce uh, Desiree, I, I just wanted to bring um, Sasha Watson back in. So Sasha, we, we, Elspeth finished there on, on the point of technology and uh, you have most recently spent six years at Arm, which is a, a global technology company with tens of thousands of technical leaders. And I'm really curious, Sasha, in terms of what your key takeaways would be in terms of leadership development with that kind of technical cohort. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, it, it was certainly a huge learning curve um, uh, for, for me in particular. I think the, the first piece um, of insight around technical leaders um, that, that I came across was just how many individuals were reluctant to be leaders and particularly in the tech industry, there's been a huge shift, um, you know, in the past 10 years or so to make sure that there are learning tracks for people who are technically excellent, but that don't want to lead a group of team or people. So individual contributors. And my challenge for, for HR L&D professionals is how can you ensure that you're not holding good people back from progressing um, because they don't want to lead groups of, of people? Um, but actually, they could be great senior voices in your organization that really impact on your strategy and the strength of your organization. That's one, one piece. I think the meaning of leadership was something that um, came up a lot. And just that journey, helping people to understand that being a leader isn't about being the most senior person in the room or actually about control. You know, in, in my view, it's about creating a following and it's actually a mindset 
and the way you behave and how you approach work rather than the, the, the former pieces. So that was a big, a big piece that I took away. Diversity of thought was um, probably one of the biggest challenges I uh, overcame, um, thank, thank goodness, in the end. Um, but I think, you know, first of all, working with technical leaders was feeling that we were talking two completely different languages. But then when you have that great meetings of great but different minds, actually, it, it actually became a really powerful way of working. And I learned so much, I'd like to think vice versa for some of the people I engaged with, um, but just around, you know, the need for data and the, the preference around logic, rather than my preference that Elspeth spoke about um, earlier around inner wisdom. I definitely go for inner wisdom. And I think also um, for anyone that's engaged with five-year-olds, um, making sure you always know the answer why so why are you doing something why is something important why is something happening so that definitely definitely came across in terms of things i learned and i think building on that was that difference between eq versus iq you know i i'm very privileged to work with some of the most brilliant minds i've ever come across um and some of the challenges um, I, I helped to overcome in the journey was around that human need for connection and empathy and the role a leader has in making sure that your your people are following and are you know emotionally connected and vested as well as intellectually stimulated around building on you know challenges for your business so yeah, those are some of the key the key pieces i could talk about this probably for a whole webinar zoe but those for me are the, are the key pieces um around working with technical leaders Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sasha. And, and just a point there, actually, we know that we're covering a lot of ground in this hour. So please, if you've got any questions, comments, please add them now into the chat so that we can get to those at, at, the, at the end of our, our conversation here. So I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted now to introduce our, our third and, and final speaker on the webinar, um, Desiree Shuck. So Desiree is the global head of leadership development for Anglo-American, um, one of the world's leading mining companies with 91,000 people. Uh, she joined in uh, 20, she was appointed as the global head in 2017. And, and in the last year, she's also taken on the additional role as the subject matter expert on the group wide inclusion and diversity work group. And this is the group that's actually responsible for transforming the company culture. So a, a massive remit. Welcome, Desiree. Uh, and I wonder if you could just kick us off in terms of just giving a little bit of an overview into who Anglo-American is for, for those uh, that don't know you. Uh, thank you very much, Zoe, and thanks, um, everyone. Good to be here. Um, so as you said, we are a globally diversified mining business. We're one of the leading mining businesses, top four. And just to make it more real, we own a majority share of De Beers Diamonds, that's where most people um, recognize us, and also most of the platinum in the world. So basically, as a mining business and the, and the size and shape of our mining business, we supply material that enables modern life. So whatever we're using to, to live today has probably been mined by either us or some of our peers in the industry. Um, just to put mining in context, um, I think that's all I'd like to say about, yeah, we're across the, across the globe everywhere. In terms of our leadership development strategy and what our goals and our, our real purpose of a leadership development is for, for a large 91,000 person company, very simply, it looks quite complicated, I think, um, on the face of it, the, the strategy, but very simply overarched by the Anglo-American purpose, which is to reimagine mining to improve people's lives, and our burning ambition to be the, the most valued mining company by 2023 in the eyes of all our stakeholders. And from a leadership development function, we need to develop and produce the leaders that are going to ensure that we achieve our burning ambition and live our purpose. And it's underpinned by our six values at the bottom of the picture. So there's three things that we really think about there. There's an environmental context that we need to think about um, and the company strategy and what's happening in leadership and, and Elspeth and Sasha have alluded to those. And then in terms of our responses, in terms of how we develop leaders, we have developed interventions that um, 
you just go back one, sorry. We've developed interventions that link to each of the different levels of, of the organization. So right from the front line all the way to executive. We work with the top 10% at each of the levels and we partner with best in class universities, business schools, providers to, to develop those leaders at each of the different levels across all geographies and functions. Um, and then we measure the impact, which I'll talk to later. So we've got a really well-defined five-year plan from a leadership development point of view. Go on to the next one, which gives us directionally where we'll be going in terms of delivering the leaders that our business will need, because we need them to be thinking about today, the short term to exactly today what they're going to do to deliver extraordinary results at the same time to be thinking long term at the same time it's not an either or and how do we create that um mindset that's both and and not either or so so this is our, our rough five-year plan wow absolutely that, that's 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 fascinating desiree and um, as you said, it's like how how do you develop that both and thinking so people are focused both mm -hmm. on the short and long term. And what's fascinating yeah. about that five year plan overview is you can see that you're bringing in that multi pronged approach that we certainly um, came out of our recent research. So um, provocative question for you, Desiree. How do you how do you measure success? You know, how do you know when a leader's actually been um, developed? Yeah, I don't think any of us are either are, are ever developed as as uh, as a as a finite destination. I think this is a constant. Um, it's a journey, so we can measure how we are developing and how leaders are developing, but we never actually develop uh, measure if someone's developed. And also, we we're really looking at um, leader agency. So. We can provide the experiences, we can provide the interventions, we can provide all the support. And at the same time, we expect our leaders to own their own journey as well. However, we can, we can measure success in a certain way. So we look at three things. We look at leader identity, which is how inside yourself do you identify yourself as a leader, because that's key. The second one is intent. What are, what are, what are you trying to achieve? And the third one is impact. Now, impact we can measure at three different levels. We can look at micro impact, which is you as a leader, how are you changing? And we can do that by 360 degree feedback before and after interventions. And we can do that for as, as long as we like. That's at the micro level. The meso level is your team. The team you're leading, the team you're part of, is it becoming more effective? What's, what's happening there? We can do that by a customer rating. And then macro, macro measurements are how, are you actually shifting the dial in terms of helping Anglo achieve our burning ambition and live our purpose how and what is and so we're looking at those three things at three different levels fantastic thank you um and just wanted to pick up so obviously with um Elsbeth um talked about the role of experiential learning and gave the example of working with a, a women's leadership program and, and getting them to think about the bigger picture and I know that you um, have pioneered some big uh, experiential programs. Um, just, just interested in your view, what, what's the role of experiential learning and, and, and what are some of the, the pluses and some of the watch outs? Okay, so we, we're really a big proponents and supporters of experiential learning. In fact, we've got a centre for experiential learning in Johannesburg, so that's how, how much we believe in it, because we really think that you learn by doing the thing and then getting feedback on it and reflecting on it. Um, there's some interesting challenges about experiential learning and the way we've been doing it in the past because we work with people globally and our model has been to fly them, the, t the top talent, fly them to different locations so they get out of their comfort zones, they experience a completely different reality to get out of their comfort zones and then to learn when they're out of their comfort zone in a, in a new environment. This smack straight slap in the face of sustainability in terms of for how long are we going to be able to justify flying lots of people across the world? I mean, as much as we believe in it, I think as L&D professionals, we're going to be called upon to look at how do we create those experiences at a much more localized level, even while you're part of a global team. And this is 
this is what we're thinking really hard about. How do we do that? So we don't give up the value of experiential learning, but we cut down the impact on our environment and on climate change and all of that. But we can't be supporting so many flights or for much longer, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks, Desiree. And, and we'll get into that when we get into the Q&A as well, because I know that we've had some questions coming in in terms of what people, what uh, what do you guys think are the biggest trends in terms of learning over the next five, ten years? So we'll get on to that in a minute. Um, so um, final point before we open it up to, to Q&A. And I wanted to, to bring you back in, Sasha, to specifically ask about this, this point about um, securing senior buy-in because we know that this is a recurring theme um, across all of our webinars in terms of you know, how how do you get buy-in from from senior leaders and, and obviously if you want to have a really effective leadership development program we've already commented on how leadership on sustainability requires a different set of interpersonal skills so it does require specific leadership programs we need the buy-in of the board. So, Sasha, really interested in your your thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. So, I thought I would start with, with, with this sentence, which might seem controversial, but the, the meaning here around all boards being the same is the function of a board is the same, right? So, we should all have a common understanding of what is the purpose of a board. The first thing, in my view, around getting the board on board is to really understand the leaders on them and those individual personalities, roles and drivers, um, because those are the things that make the difference. And then um, just to cover these these three points briefly is one is around relevance and showing a deep understanding of your business, your industry and the broader landscape for me is critical showing your relevance. And the piece here, especially if you work in a fast moving industry like technology industry is ensuring that your approach to whatever challenges you're solving in your role keeps up with that industry. Um, you know, you said earlier, Zoe, that some of the practices that your research found is that people look back. So again, you know, staying relevant is about looking forward and moving with the, with the pace of your business. Connected to this is about being part of the conversation. I've mentored so many people that have said to me, you know, how do I get a seat at the table? And I feel very passionately that actually sitting at that table is sometimes very long and laborious. So it's not about sitting at the table, it's about having your voice in the room. Because if you have your voice in a room, you're able to amplify your impact across many rooms and many borders and many teams. So actually being part of the conversation, having your input and your insights um, with as many people as possible means that actually can be heard in many more places rather than just one room around that one table. Mm. And again, this is this is for me again um, all around building credibility. And of course, it's obvious you need credibility to get the board on board, but it's about how you build that credibility. And a key piece here for me is around have a point of view and you know have a sort of advisory consultative approach to your point of view so that it doesn't feel that you are being protective or subjective you know have a credible point of view that's above and beyond your outside of your comfort zone and out of your lane so to speak and then my next and final point around getting the board on board is to continuously ask yourself some questions so is what you are doing or proposing going to make your company stronger you know will it bring a competitive advantage and um, does it solve a business challenge or you know are you addressing these as a stakeholder and continuously ask yourself these questions because if you can't answer these questions with evidence i would suggest you're not ready to get the board on board you need to do a bit more work to connect these two pieces and certainly i think if you can start a conversation with the board addressing one of these questions or you know looking at one of these through one of these lenses you have a way richer conversation with, with a senior leader Brilliant. Thank you, Sasha. That's really, really sound and sage input. So, so thank you. So at that point, we've heard um, a lot of great advice um, from our from our three speakers. We've um, had Elspeth really laying out some of the sort of foundational pieces um, 
and Sasha and Desiree bring it to life with um, many examples from, from, from their experience. And I see that we've had a, a number of questions that have um, been coming in. So thank you for those and, and, and do keep those coming. And, and the first question, perhaps I could um, open this up to you, Desiree, first, as I mentioned, is um, what do you see as the biggest trends in terms of learning over the next five to 10 years, particularly with regard to, to leadership on sustainability? And, and you, you've already mentioned the point around, you know, how do we give people rich, transformative experiences, perhaps without getting them on a plane? Uh, just wondered what else you're seeing in terms of, of trends. I think one of the biggest trends is accessibility of tiny pieces of learning and when you need them. Just exactly the same as the way we use Google for every single thing. When we want to go and look at it, we need to, on the job, we need to have um, learning pieces available to us like that. And I think that the other big thing is around um, all of us learning how to give on the spot feedback to each other. And I'm, I'm seeing that that really becoming a massive thing in, within our company and we encouraging it on every level. That, you know, the people that we work with see us all the time. They see us in our good moments, they see us in our not so great moments. And if you've got a couple of people who just give on the spot feedback and we've got some systems that are, are enabling that. So it's the use of technology, but actually the use of technology to encourage people to be more connected and not less connected. I'm seeing a huge trend is to be absolutely connected in terms of your, we call it social process. How do you know yourself and how do you know each other and how do you help each other using technology and then um, maybe it's face to face. But I think it's a, the immediate accessibility um, aspect. That's one of them. And I think, yeah. yeah. That, that, that's that's a, a brilliant answer. Thank you, Desiree. And as I said, that very much ties into one of the insights that we got um, from the research that we did in building leaders for long term business performance. This idea of, I like your expression of tiny pieces of learning. So how can we have sort of actionable, learnable, teachable chunks that actually we can take away and, and, and bring into our sphere of influence immediately? Um, and and um, Sasha, I wonder if you've got any um, um, Thing to add on that last point from Desiree, encouraging people to be more connected, not unconnected, the use of technology. I wonder how that played out for you, was played out for you. No, I, I definitely agree. And I, I actually like to call it bite-sized learning mm. and, um, and on demand, right? So I think it's small bits of learning on demand. So I think technology is going to amplify how we learn. And I think that what we learn will also evolve. So I'm seeing so much more interconnectedness across hierarchy. So, you know, reverse mentoring um, or learning across discipline and bringing different pieces of content together. And I think I've definitely seen a lot more purpose and profit put together for, around learning as well. So that interventions are not just about how do we make more money, but how do you make more money and have a greater impact? So I think there's going to be evolution on how we learn with tech and then what we learn. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, super. And I've um, had a, a, a question that's just come in, which related to, is, is a little bit related to that your final point there, um, Sasha. So any practical examples from, from the three of you in terms of how do we get the content of leadership development strategies prioritized against competing business objectives? And we all, we know that often there's, there's something that might be flavor of the month um, within, the, within the business that seems to get a lot of the resources. So um, any, any advice there in terms of um, ensuring that, um, learn leadership development strategies are prioritized any tips do you want to kick off with you desiree again and then i'll go to yeah that. one of one of the things that we we ensure is that we become the conduit if we've got leadership development say in, in our academy that, and we've got um programs across all the different levels and we've got for instance a brand new values piece that's coming in to our company right now we become one of the primary conduits of getting that message to people in a very real way. So it's not, for me, it's not competing at all. We are the way to, to drive the strategy. 
we on competing for resources we just a method of, of of ensuring that people understand the strategy understand the new whatever's going on in the company as well so we we constantly work very collaboratively with with all the new strategy pieces that are coming out brilliant i think that's that's a great way of reframing it especially how how can leadership development become the enabler um for for the 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 overarching business strategy. Sasha, anything that you would like to add there? I need to yeah, I love that term enabler, Zoe, because I think that's key. And I think I'd just say, I'd go back to those questions that I raised earlier to say, you shouldn't have to compete um, or rethink your content. If what you're doing is making the company stronger and helping competitive advantage and solving a business problem, you shouldn't have to compete because what you're doing is going to be so important to the company's future success. So I would say rather than try and compete, have some reflection on is what we're doing relevant and is what we're doing making the company stronger? And then you shouldn't have to compete. You will be adding and therefore enabling. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Sasha. Absolutely. It's like, how do we ensure that individual, our leaders, and individuals across the organization are thriving and ensuring that the organization's fit for purpose in the future. Um, Elspeth, I want to bring you back in. I wondered if, um, firstly, if you had any thoughts on this or, or also the, the first question in, as well in terms of um, trends that are coming up that you see. Well, I mean, I, I was just speaking about the, I think it's uh, really important. I think Sasha did bring it up earlier that we acknowledge there's leadership everywhere in an organization. And I mean, I, from Dave's presentation, you can see that Anglo-American is acknowledging that. And so I would say, look for unsung heroes, look for people who are doing really interesting stuff and really, you know, acknowledge it and embrace it. And so I think that's going to become more and more important that it's just seen as, as an everyday thing is showing leadership. I guess for me, I think online learning is going to become much more important and it's interesting because we feel that face-to-face -face and leadership development requires you to see each other and to speak to each other and to connect each other and I think we've got to find ways with, with online learning uh, to be able to allow that to happen differently um, and that's a challenge for large institutions like the University of Cambridge. Um, I mean, CISL is shifting, but I'm not sure many universities understand the and how to be really creative with online learning. And you really do reach many, many more people um, and access. Yeah. So that, that's just my my two thoughts on on those things. Yeah. yeah no, that's a, that's a, a very good point to bring up, actually, there mm -hmm. Elspeth, the the role of both blended learning, so face to face and online, and also online. I know that with our um, online learning programs here at CISL, you know, we've reached 2,000 individuals literally over the last 18 months. So it, it really gives you the opportunity to, to scale very, very quickly and that we're bringing in online components to, to many of our programs. Um, I just wanted to, to pick up on the, the piece, actually, Sasha, that you mentioned earlier with regard to the role of communication skills for leadership development because this is the question that we've had um, come up and I know that you made the point about being heard and actually if you, you're being if, when it comes to being heard have you got something to, to say how's it been validated and and, and you know, we heard the power of that image from Elsbeth earlier when she was talking about the hand and the, the digits the importance of storytelling in, in leadership development as well so starting with you Sasha just wondered how important you think communication skills are for leadership development I mean I think it's critical and I'm so surprised how many L&D and HR professionals don't engage with communication professionals to help really build those programs because the theory is, is, is one thing, but actually only a real comms professional will help you really round out that learning. And if you think of some of the great leaders of all time, um, you know, be they political leaders or religious leaders, or whatever, something that really binds them is their ability to tell an incredible story and communicate. So for me, communication skills are what makes some of the best leaders go from you know being great leaders of a business to being a memorable individual that leaves a legacy i think it's how they communicate 
Brilliant. Thank you, Sasha. Um, Elsbeth, I just wonder if you had any thoughts on this one? Well, I, I go back to my little thing that I always do say, quieten your cleverness so that you can hear. And I think that I think really important to be able to listen, but you can't listen if your mind is sort of busy answering the question or wanting to say what you want to say. So I think that's a key skill in communication. I think that for leaders is to be able to really listen and uh, to what people are saying. So active listening. So yeah, it's a really important part of leadership development. And I think appreciation, the ability to appreciate um, is a really important skill, which is part of communication and how you do it has to be culturally sensitive. But I think really showing people's uh, the appreciation is a really important skill as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But thank you. And I, I think those are all really important points and actually takes us back, back to um, Desiree's earlier point about the importance of peer feedback that obviously very much starts with listening and also starts with um, appreciation. Um, Desiree, anything else that you'd like to add to this point? Yeah, I'd just like to add, I think the gap is important and that's the gap between listening and responding. And often the gap is too short or not thought through enough and we 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 act or i know we've taken one aspect of communication but i, I think we need to mind the gap a little bit <laughs> and think about that uh, uh because and as leaders we it's, we we should take it upon ourselves to be working on our communication skills every single day because we judge by the our ability to communicate whether it's written, whether it's spoken, whether it's how we conduct meetings. That is, uh, if you were a warrior going to war without a weapon, that's what a leader is who can't communicate effectively. So best we be working on that all the time. And that's also a lifelong journey in trying to get really good at it. And some people find it easier than others. But I don't think you can lead without being able to communicate effectively. Yeah, absolutely. Very good point. It's, it's something that we're we're looking at, we're um, newsflash, creating a new online course, which is going to be called, um, communicating for influence and impact. So watch this space. So we've had a question around diversity. Um, so the broad question is, what are the benefits of diversity in leadership? And, and um, one of our um, participants was very interested in specifically what Anglo is doing in leadership de development to in encourage diversity. So, um, so firstly, Sasha, perhaps I can invite you and, and obviously thinking broadly beyond, in terms of diversity and inclusion, the benefits of leadership. So, I mean, I think if you take that you need diversity that is obvious around, you know, gender, race, etc., cetera, um, as, as a basis to make a strong leadership team, some of the benefits, again, if you're talking to your board are around innovation, so the great ideas that come from different mindsets and learnings and backgrounds, um, you know, have really set companies uh, apart. I think it helps also to build stronger teams, stronger workforces. And there's a plethora of research out there that shows the difference between, you know, people that are all the same leading and diverse teams leading difference in profit, productivity, morale, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a wonderful um, piece around diversity is if, if your boards and your leadership and your approach are representing your customers and your people, you're way more likely to have a great merriment of, and a, you know, a, a meeting of minds. Um, if your boards and your teams and your learning aren't representative of your stakeholders, you know, you're far more likely to have a misalignment um, and, and therefore, you know, la less success. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Desiree, specifically from the Anglo perspective? So at Anglo-American, we specifically change it to inclusion and diversity because we are, all of our um, initiatives in the space are around how do we create processes and systems where every single voice is heard? How do we do that? And if we as leaders, we are thinking about that all the time. Because if every single person's heard, then what will follow is that we will get different people into the room as well. But um, we used to only have one type of voice that was heard. It was a very loud, bombastic type of voice. 
and what where we're seeing the shift is how do we hear everybody um so that that's what we're doing at anglo-american on different fronts in at different functions we've got um as you know a massive global global interventions across the board we just won a few awards by inclusion and diversity um initiatives but it, the, the underpinning of it is hearing every single voice in the room yeah absolutely now as, as what often happens we tend to get a flurry of questions in the last couple of minutes so i'm gonna put a couple out there but i'm very conscious of time so um two interrelated questions so we've had a question around um how agile projects can give people the chance to lead and collaborate and and thoughts on how um agile has changed how you train people to lead and a related question is the key skills that technical leaders need to develop in the next decade now i know sasha you probably covered quite a lot of that but sasha any thoughts particularly on um how agile has helped or key skills for technical leaders so yeah i mean i i've seen more and more companies adopting this this agile approach it's it's very on trend right now i think that the, the the good thing around that is back to one of the earlier points i had around co-creating and integrating i think that the, the beauty of working in an agile approach and bringing cross-purpose and working team together is that you have very very quick and focused teams um, looking at problems together with all different um, mindsets and thoughts with much stronger outcomes working at a different pace so certainly especially in a technical environment you see real benefits of understanding many disciplines and working at pace pace together so i definitely see that there's a place for it i don't know how long we'll do that until the next big thing comes in but certainly it's very on trend right now super and um elspeth one to you one for you we've had a question how do sustainability professionals develop systems thinking any quick thoughts there well uh... I mean, just the way that you present sustainability shows that you've really got to understand it's a massive, big system that we're part of and we can't, and you've got to really understand that there's multiple issues and the notion of wicked problems is, comes up very strongly in it because you think you can intervene at one place, but you just create a problem somewhere else. So there's this notion of unintended consequences. So I think it's the only way to teach sustainability is through a systems systems thinking lens I don't think you can teach it any other way yeah because you cannot just do one thing with environment and not understand the social implications and vice versa so really important that um, it's taught through a systems thinking lens yeah absolutely and a uh, final question um, for you Desiree um, we've had a question in terms of any suggested frameworks for providing and receiving feedback quick 30 seconds on that one <laughs> yeah, we use, um, this is a situation, this is the impact. Um, the, uh, the big thing that we use is assume good intent um, and um, also the neuro leadership piece around asking for feedback. So not just giving the feedback, just encouraging people to learn how to ask for feedback please could you give me feedback about and then re being really specific so we've got a, a whole blend of ones we use but i think the most important thing is to encourage people to request feedback yeah um yeah. and not just pop up with cleverness around what you're seeing yeah absolutely well, well thank you so much for that um so unfortunately we're coming to the end of our hours webinar uh, just a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be available and um, our next webinar is coming up in December and on December the 10th. And please join me in thanking Desiree, Elspeth and Sasha for a really rich conversation. And I'd just like to say, hopefully we, we have communicated that leadership on sustainability requires a different set of interpersonal skills and we've start, started to dig into that. Um, my final point is this is part of our repertoire of thinking in our series of, on leadership. And we're really interested in continuing the conversation with you in terms of where should this repertoire of thinking go in 2020? So very much look forward to any conversations that you'd like to have with us. 
and look forward to you joining us for the next webinar in December. So thank you all for joining and particular thank you to our speakers. Goodbye. Thank you, Zoe. Bye.